Oh boy, this is so crazy. Uh, wrote a little something. Oh my God. All right. Thank you so much um, to the Hollywood Film Awards and Sony Picture Classics for believing in this film and book that holds such a special place in so many people's hearts. It's quite surreal to be in front of so many actors and filmmakers here that I've spent years studying and admiring. If you all started talking or going on your cell phones as I'm speaking, I really wouldn't mind at all because I'm pretty nervous right now. So if you guys just want to start talking, that's fine. Uh, but I guess I should really thank um, the captain of our ship and our director, Luca Guadagnino. <laughs> Luca, to be a part of your ode to first love has been the greatest challenge in honor of my young career. I'll be endlessly thankful and stupefied that you put an actor with so little street cred as myself into a role as layered and complex and contradictory and confused as Elio Perlman. Every day on this set in Northern Italy was an acting masterclass to be opposite Michael Stuhlbarg and Army Hammer in front of the camera. These are two men and actors that I admire so deeply and were such strong mentors on set and off. It really brings to mind the quote, it takes a village. Michael, I'm grateful for the paternal form our relationship has taken on since the end of the film. And Army, I'm thankful I have an adult homie in my life now I can call now when adult things confuse me. You know, the effect this film has had on people who have seen it in the last year, in conjunction with the actual experience of getting to shoot an Andre Osman novel in Northern Italy, it, it's already exceeded my wildest dreams, and I'm kind of baffled that the movie is yet to come out. But to those that see it later this month, I hope you enjoy Michael's speech of a lifetime, Army Hammer dancing the 80s music, and myself having sex with a peach. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs> And the 2017 IFP Gotham Award for Best Feature goes to... Call Me By Your Name, Luco Guadagnino. We did not prepare any speech, <laughs> literally. Now, I only want to say one thing and then I pass the word to my wonderful, wonderful group of people who made this movie possible. Thank you, guys. I think, above all, Call Me By Your Name is a movie about compassion and transmission of knowledge and becoming better people in the meeting with other people. And so for me, this is a testament to that. Thank you. Uh, we started this film many, many years ago, many, with Peter Spears, 10 years ago, and Howard Rosman. But this version of this film, we started on my kitchen table, snapping peas, with Mr. James Ivory here. So I pass the mic to Jim. Thank you, thank you so much. I can't imagine I'm standing here. It's the most wonderful uh, uh, experience. Uh, I, I'm not used to winning things, so um, I just get nominated. Um, it, it was a terrific two years of my life working on this film, and I think I can speak for everyone saying that. I also wanted to say that while this movie was made in Italy and depicts Italy, it began in a room on the Upper West Side when Andre Asiman wrote the novel uh, alone by himself, a beautiful novel, uh, and the spirit of all of us here begins also with Andre. Thank you to Andre, a true New Yorker, and thank you to the Gotham Awards. And I want to thank, of course, Michael Barker, 
and Tom Bernard, Dylan Liner, Carmelo Pirone, and everybody at Sony Picture Classics. You are fantastic. You are the best. Thank you so much. And the 2017 IFP Gotham Award for Breakthrough Actor goes to, they're all amazing, so, you know. Timothy Chalamet, call me by your name. <laughs> Okay, I am also terrified of teleprompters, so uh, I'll be looking straight down. First, a big thank you to IFP and the Gothams for this tremendous honor. I don't know who I fooled to let me into a category with someone as talented as Mary J. Blige, but I will take it. I'm only 21, so I'm more of a growing pains guy than a my life kind of guy. But the ease with which you are able to traverse across so many mediums with such skill, Miss Blige, is a tremendous inspiration. And I'm simply honored to have been included in the category with you tonight. And I'm serious about that. Um, a big thanks to Sony Picture Classics and Michael Barker and Tom Bernard for believing in this film. And the biggest thanks to the maestro Luca Guadagnino for captaining our ship with such care and love and affection and mastery and for giving me the role of a lifetime. Thank you to James Ivory for providing the words to this role in the classic Merchant Ivory pedigree. I'm honored to be a part of it. A big and tall thank you to my dance partner, Army Hammer, for being so goddamn talented and for providing the safest of hands with this material. And a big thanks to Michael Stuhlbarg, my father figure turned father figure. And lastly, since I am a New York guy, I did go to LaGuardia High School. <laughs> wow. Big LaGuardia contingent tonight, all right. You know, I thought I'd take a moment to thank some New York artists that have inspired me to pursue this crazy career in the arts. So with that, a big thank you to John Patrick Shanley, Edie Falco, Mary J. Blige, Greta Gerwig, Josh Safty, John Leguizamo, Cardi B, Al Pacino, Martin Scorsese, Kid Cudi, and my mom who's sitting right there. Peace and love, thank you. Cool, thank you. And now that you're reminded what both of our nipples look like, it's truly my great honor and pleasure to call him by his name this time, my co-star and dear friend, Timothy Chalamet. All right, first up. Please don't be awkward, all right. Okay. Thank you so much to the Palm Springs International Film Festival for this award, and to Michael Barker and Tom Bernard at Sony Picture Classics for believing in this film. It's truly an awesome feeling to get to be in the Rising Stars category tonight, alongside Gal Gadot. Gal, your film has literally made 250 times more money than my movie has. So I'm left feeling a little insecure, unqualified to be up here, but uh, that's okay. Man, Army, thank you for that speech. <laughs> it's a lot easier having to do this up here with you because you're one of my best buddies. Although I will say that was a genuinely terrifying experience backstage. I didn't know which way you were going to go with that, so thank you. <laughs> thank you for keeping it PG. Um, seriously, I'm really grateful for your big brotherhood and your guidance and your friendship to have someone in your position and as talented as you are be a mentor to me these last two years it's been valuable to me and man and i really i really mean it man and a special thanks to army's wife elizabeth chambers who's here tonight as well who is as crucial to this process as anyone and who let me crawl all over her husband for two months so thank you for that thank you elizabeth 
I want to give a huge thanks to my director, Luca Guadagnino. Luca, thank you for taking a chance on an absolute nobody. And I have often tried to communicate to you how grateful I am for this film, and it's difficult for me to put into words, but I mean it. Thank you. Thank you with all my heart, because you are literally making my life right now. You know, thanks to this film, I could be an old washed up guy in the future now. Be be there is something to be washed up from. That's this movie. So thank you for that, Luca. Uh, and I really want to thank my agent, Brian Swartstrom, who's here in attendance tonight as well. And I hope people don't cringe when they see a young actor on stage and hear the words agent and thanks in the same sentence. But truly, thank you, Brian, for your incredible guidance these last five years. Because of your work with Tilda Swinton and Luca Guadagnino, I simply wouldn't be standing up here without you. And without your husband and producer, Peter Spears, as well. I met with Brian for the first time when I was finishing up my senior year at LaGuardia High School in New York. And he said to me, go to college, finish school, don't worry about acting, there's no rush, you're only young once. So I went to college for a year. <laughs> and I thought to myself, man, this is terrible. <laughs> I gotta get the hell out of here. I wanna be acting. And it's been an incredible ride since. I know you got my back, Brian. And as you once said to me, your agents represent you, and you represent your agents. So I got your back as well. And lastly, a big thanks to my mama who's watching at home. Mom, I love you. Thank you for everything. And because you texted me about this 20 minutes ago backstage, I left the Apple TV remote underneath the TV for some reason, and I'm sorry about that. Peace and love. Thank you. Thank you for that. Our next honor is the Spotlight Award at... You're making my life right now, seriously. You know, I used to think when I was like 35 or 40, I'd have a wife and kids and I could have a family life. And now I know I'll be in front of a TV. Okay. Ah, oh, boy. Okay. Thank you to the New York film critics, to Michael Barker and Tom Bernard at Sony Picture Classics for believing in this film. But most of all, thank you to Luca Guadagnino who just gave this speech. And Luca, it's been difficult for me to put into words how grateful I am. And this means very little coming from a 22 year old, but you are truly a genius. And I don't know how an established auteur like yourself took a chance on someone with very little street cred like me, but I will eternally be grateful. And you're making my life right now, seriously. You know, I used to think when I was like 35 or 40, I'd have a wife and kids and I could have a family life. And now I know I'll be in front of a TV watching Call Me By Your Name with a glass of whiskey, thinking those were the glory years, those were the glory days, you know? It's also cool to follow up Tiffany. Tiffany, you know grapefruits very well, I know peaches. <laughs> Okay. Oh my god. Okay. <laughs> and <laughs> Okay, and uh <laughs> I'm acting like I'm not hearing you. I'm hearing everything you're saying. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Don't do that bit. I know that bit. I know that bit. Okay. And Army Hammer was here tonight. Army, thank you so much, man. Yes. I, you know, I'm sure Sersha can attest to this as well, but being a young actor, you know, you're opposite older actors in scenes that are often very well established, have, you know, big names to themselves. And I got, I, I was the luckiest kid in the world to be there with Army because you are extremely talented, you're kind, your spirit is generous, and you haven't gotten sick of me yet. <laughs> so, I, I, and seriously, you're a big brother to me, man. I love you. Seriously. <laughs> okay. We were on a plane 12 hours to, ago, me and Army. I'm a nervous flyer. 
And every time there was turbulence, I would turn to him, and he'd look at me, and he'd go, we're going to crash. <laughs> you know, this award means the world to me, because as Luca alluded to, I'm a fourth-generation New Yorker. My, my, <laughs> my grandmother was born on 163rd Street in Grand Concourse in the Bronx on January 2nd, 1927. Had a long Broadway dance career that included shows like Kiss Me Kate and It's a Wonderful Town. When my mom and Enid's daughter was seven years old, she was enlisted in the School of American Ballet before attending the Performing Arts High School on 48th Street and Broadway. Some 30 years later, when my sister was born, who's right there, she too, <laughs> yes, she too is enlisted in the School of American Ballet and later attended the Performing Arts High School as well, which was now called LaGuardia and where I went to for high school. Yeah, <laughs> okay, LaGuardia in the house, okay. I spent the ages of eight to 12 backstage at the New York State Theater. I refuse to call it the Coke Theater. <laughs> yeah. As my sister would perform in the Nutcracker, I would roam the backstage hallways a bit aimless, but with no shortage of costumes and rehearsal studios to entertain myself in. When I was 12 years old, after attending one of my sister Pauline's performances, I petitioned my mom and grandma to see Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight with me. We went to AMC Empire 25 in Times Square for a 7.30 screening. And I left, <laughs> I left that theater a changed man. And I'm serious about that. Heath Ledger's performance in that film was visceral and viral to me, and I now had the acting bug. I didn't know that around that time, Mr. Ledger was accepting the award for Best Actor at the New York Film Critics Circle for Brokeback Mountain. I didn't know that a brilliant director halfway across the world named Luca Guadagnino was beginning pre-production on a film called I Am Love. I didn't know that Michael Stuhlbarg was wowing audiences in The Pillow Man on Broadway. I didn't know that a nervous Army Hammer was getting prepared to audition for David Fincher in The Social Network. I did not know that a genius author named Andre Osman was in a small apartment on the Upper West Side putting the finishing touches on a book called Call Me By Your Name. And there was certainly no idea that I would get to collaborate with all these incredible artists some eight years later in Northern Italy for three months. An immersive acting experience I will use as a model to prepare for all my future roles. And I mean that, Luca. I accept this award with all the gratitude I'm capable of. Thank you to the New York Film Critics Circle. Thank you to New York. And thank you to Greta Gerwig and Saoirse Ronan as well for letting me tag along in Lady Bird. Greta, I was in a bar, I was in a bar, I was in a bar last week and someone said, hey, isn't that the douchebag from Lady Bird? So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, anyway, thank you, peace and love, thank you. Thank you to the National Board of Review for this honor. And thank you to Michael Barker and Tom Bernard at Sony Picture Classics for believing in this film. Thank you for that army. Oop, you're not on that side, you're on that side, <laughs> okay. Thank you for that, you're truly my brother. He said we've taken 200 plane flights together and that's true. I'm like a nervous flyer and every time he sees me getting nervous, he'll go, we're gonna crash. <laughs> so. Thank you for that. Thank you also to Michael Stuhlbarg, who's here tonight, who plays Mr. Mr. Perlman. Michael is my father figure turned father figure, who is sitting next to my father. So this is very weird. I'm truly honored to be included alongside the other names tonight and now to be in the lineage of this acclaimed organization's past. Let's not forget when this organization was established. 1909. 1909, yes. I was negative 87 years old. There had yet to be a world war. There was no such thing as a Big Mac or the grapefruit technique and fire and fury, and fire and fury inside the White House had yet to be written. The National Board of Review was put together, at least according to Wikipedia, to combat Mayor George McClellan's hostile stance towards filmmaking. 
an art form he considered ethically corrosive and for the masses. That was really trippy for me to find out and kind of exciting. I think movies can sometimes get lost in a coastal vacuum. I've often thought to myself, I don't want to act for actors, I want to act for people. So it makes it all the more sweet to receive an award from an organization that was trying to protect the freedom of however and whatever sort of expression manifested itself in a film. I was at the New York Critics Circle last week. I got to tell a story about seeing The Dark Knight for the first time, how that me really made me want to act. It was really uh, a transformative experience for me. I didn't know anything about acting, but I knew I wanted to play something or someone like Heath Ledger's Joker. When I got to LaGuardia High School, which is here in New York, we studied, we st <laughs> LaGuardia crowd, okay. We studied, we studied Sanford Meisner's technique our freshman year. In case you were wondering, Mr. Meisner was born two years before the formation of the National Board of Review in Brooklyn. A favorite exercise of my professors was the repetition exercise, one where you start with an anonymous enough phrase and you see what emotional state it leads you to by way of repetition. And it's kind of an amazing thing to watch. Two kids will be saying tomato to each other, and before you know it, everybody's crying about their dad. <laughs> it's true. My dad's here tonight. I love you, dad. <laughs> I don't have any weird shit with you, I promise, okay. <laughs> but seriously, this, this exercise helped tremendously. Where there was artifice and active performance, there was now simply reaction. I was hanging out with some drama friends one night. We decided to watch something funny. We randomly chose an Adam Sandler comedy we thought it had a cool poster, Punch Drunk Glove. It was clear from the first long wide shot of Mr. Sandler at a desk where he's in a deep argument about coupons, this was not a cheesy Adam Sandler comedy. I sat there watching and watching and watching and then something happened, it clicked. I was inside the world of an introvert the way I'd only been reading books like The Perks of Being a Wallflower or something like Crime and Punishment. And Adam Sandler clued me into a world I had never been and then it was over. My buddies and I researched the film as soon as it was over. The writer-director was Paul Thomas Anderson. That's a cool name, I thought. That's a cool name. You, you know, it could, it could be a rapper or something, you know? So I went home and I watched the only other available movie of his on Netflix because I'm a millennial, The Master. Wait, 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 I take that back. That's like the worst thing to say to the National Board of Review. I went to the public library and I rented The Master. <laughs> And in watching that film, it was the only other time I had the visceral reaction I did watching The Dark Knight some six years earlier. About 40 minutes into the film, there's a processing scene, an interrogation of sorts. Philip Seymour Hoffman's character says to Joaquin Phoenix that he must answer everything he asks of him honestly and without blinking. I was floored. The scene mirrors the Meisner technique in many ways, except instead of fumbling through the exercise myself or watching two classmates stumble through it, the scene contained two masters at work, open, vulnerable, and in Mr. Phoenix's case, physically self-loathing. To this day, I don't know a scene that feels so intensely honest and simultaneously an ode to the Meisner technique. The scene was somehow messy and the most direct piece of acting I've ever seen. I don't know. I don't know why I'm bringing this up. You know. I guess there's something nice about getting to hear your own voice shouting out your hero in front of your hero, because I know he's somewhere here tonight. I think he's somewhere here tonight. And I know this shout out doesn't increase the likelihood that I'll get to work with you, but that's not the goal. I mean, if you want to work, let's talk, because, you know, <laughs> yeah, we'll figure it out, you know. But, uh, but uh, rather, I just want to say thanks because, Mr. Paul Thomas Anderson, you're a major, major reason I'm standing on the stage right now. I mean it. And I'm humbled to be on any sort of program with your name on it and because you're a genius. So thank you to the National Board of Review. Shouts out to Greta for letting me tag along for Lady Bird. And peace and love. Thank you for having me. Cool. Thank you so much for that, Stephen. Um, wow, I didn't know I was doing all that while I was shooting the movie. <laughs> I, mean, I was with Army, who plays Oliver once, and the film critic Anthony Lane was around, and I said to Army, oh, you know, that's Anthony Lane, I really want to speak to him, I, I love his writing. And Army said, you don't want to speak to that guy, what he has to say about the movie is way smarter than what you have to say. So, uh, and, and sure enough, he asked me about, uh, about a book I was reading in a specific scene. And I didn't know what it was at the time, but 16 months later I didn't, and I thought, oh, fuck, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, anyhow, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thank you so much to the Los Angeles Film Critics Association for this honor. 
And as always, thank you to Michael Barker and Tom Bernard at Sony Picture Classics for taking on this movie, believing in it. You guys are very close this time, so, okay. And the biggest thanks, obviously, goes to my director and the maestro, Luca Guadagnino, but I will get into this more later. There's something particularly gratifying about getting this award as I was born and raised in New York, and I hope that isn't like blasphemy here, but uh, Los Angeles has always scared me a bit. But in truth, Los Angeles has become a second home of sorts in recent years. One of the sweeter moments of the last year was getting to bring my sister to the Golden Globes. She was elated and proud, and I could look around and be assured that I was not the least famous person there, because that was my sister. But, uh, <laughs> but honestly, my, my favorite part of this last year, getting to act in other films and getting to talk about Call Me By Your Name, has not been having to audition constantly. I try to learn from the folks I work with, and I did a reading with William H. Macy once, who said to me that the best thing that happened to him in, in his life, besides having a wife and kids, was not having to constantly audition. You know, in New York, I could have a terrible audition, and to make up for my mood, I could dance on the subway for 30 minutes. And to those of you that thought that was metaphorical, it's not. <laughs> a lot of my old rap videos have made their way online, and I'm just waiting for a video of me dancing on the two train. <laughs> and yet, in Los Angeles, this was never the case. A terrible audition is always followed by a long Uber ride home. <laughs> I've often thought to myself, the most important part of auditioning is the second you leave the room. The easier you go on yourself, the more likely you'll be able to bounce back and act without anxiety the next time you audition. And this was just a mentality I always had a hard time ascribing to in Los Angeles the emptiness and existential crisis that it is to walk out of a casting office on Sunset Boulevard was overwhelming. In 2015, I auditioned for a casting director named Sarah Finn at her office on 588 North Larchmont Boulevard in a project I was dying to do, Spider-Man. And <laughs> I read twice, and I left sweating in a total panic. I called my agent, Brian Swartzroom, who's here tonight, and I said to him, Brian, I thought about this a lot, and I have to go back and knock on that door and read again. And he told me the story of Sean Young, who, in an attempt to become Catwoman, had scared everyone away when she showed up at the studio gates in costume. <laughs> the irony is that it was a project in which I met the, di the director three years prior that wasn't a big studio film and where I never auditioned that has been the medium to getting to go to dinners and things like this and to get an introduction like the one I got from you, Stephen, which please, 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 for everyone in the room, no, this doesn't fly over my head for a second. None of this is taken for granted. I know the risk of what it is to become an old, washed-up person now because of this moment. So, uh, um, and uh, I, I'm just so appreciative that it was a story that feels like it had to be told about uh, a boundaryless and definitionless expression of love that is maybe counterintuitive to the Western and stringent ways we've talked about love and sexuality in the past that, again, is the medium in which I get to be here with all of you tonight. Now, Luca, you are, <laughs> this means nothing coming from a 22-year-old, but seriously, you're like a genius to me. And the experience of getting to be there a month and a half prior to the movie, and Luca has this incredible screening room in Crema where we shot the movie in this beautiful apartment. And it was like a film education. It was really like getting to go to school, uh, and where I watched Babette's Feast, which I understand to be a great movie, but I, it's just not my kind of movie, Luca. <laughs> it's great, okay? It's great. I'm just being honest, okay? <laughs> it's excellent. I'm looking at the critics shaking their head. It's excellent, but it's just, it's not for me, okay? But also, but also Alien, which is a great movie, and I loved. Um, and, uh, <laughs> and, and Body Double. Um, so uh, listen, <laughs> it's true. And I'm still at a loss as to why you took a chance on someone with as little street cred as myself. But thank you, and I, I've said it before, but you, you, this is the ride of a lifetime, Luca, really. And, and I talked about like, something like Spider-Man, and weirdly, it's the gift of the universe here that I'm, 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 I'm getting people saying, keep, you know, keep working on these kinds of projects, and keep working with things of integrity and, and that are more independently oriented. And certainly, if it was you know, a Chris Nolan opportunity or Guillermo, you know, give me a call if you want to work, okay? <laughs> I'm totally serious about that. Yeah, exactly, exactly, exactly. Please, please, you know, then that's great, but uh, I, uh, 
I, 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 t I know what, what an honor this is and that, you know, I want to do everyone in here proud that, that gave me a vote and, and you know, that I'll career, continue pursuing these things with integrity with the last person I mentioned that can really, is only the perfect roadmap when I look at this, and it's Michael Stuhlbarg. And thank you so much, Michael, for, I mean, the mentorship on this movie, and as I said, I'm a New York guy, and you know, New York, Michael is a stage legend in New York, and it was Martin McDonough, the pillow man, that was my first exposure to him, but I mean, with Shape of Water and The Post and Call Me By Your Name and Fargo, it's like, how do you do it, man? <laughs> yeah. So, um, um, and I don't want to end awkwardly like that, but, uh, <laughs> but uh, I guess I'm just going to have to, but seriously, thank you so much for having me tonight. Really. Thank you. Take the freedom of a lazy summer in northern Italy, apply it to a young man on the cusp of discovering himself, introduce him to an unexpected temptation, gift him with a wise and caring family, a precocious talent, plus an inquisitive nature, add wine, pasta, bikes, disco, let all the ingredients rise and watch him come of age before your eyes. This is the movie our producers Peter Spears, Luca Guadagnino, Emily Georges, and Marco Marobito fashioned from James Ivory's screenplay, directed by Luca himself. I'm so proud to be a part of this film, and I'm proud to call it by its name, which is not Call Me By Your Name, or Call My Name, or Call Me Maybe, <laughs> or James and the Giant Peach. <laughs> I, uh, oh, come on, man, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying something, all right? Okay. I've actually heard it called all those. Uh, it's Call Me By Your Name. Please enjoy. Oh. Brought my program up here for some reason. <laughs> so listen, um, thank you so much for this award. And um, thank you to Luca Guadagnino, who's my director, who's sitting right there. And Luca, you've literally gifted me my career at this point. So I thank you deeply for that. And Army Hammer was my tongue wrestling partner. <laughs> Thanks for being here as well and uh, this is a huge honor and I mean uh, I'm happy I brought this program up here because I see Daniel Day Lewis's name and I see Gary Oldman's name and I think to myself who did I fool to be up here but it comes with a tremendous amount of gratitude like I said and I love filmmaking I love acting this is what I live and breathe so to be in a room full of people that a lot of them I've been studying and admiring for a number of years, it, it means the world to me again. And uh, I just, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I hope to be here again. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you for a wonderful evening, Sir Show. You. Thanks for coming out. Thank you. And now it's time to introduce Timothy Chalamet. Cool. My name is Timothy Chalamet, and I have the great privilege of getting to present the incredibly talented Sersha Ronan with this award tonight. Sersha is no stranger to Santa Barbara, having won the Virtuoso Award for her performance in Brooklyn. And as some of you know, Sersha is friends with U2 and Ed Sheeran, so I am sorry that they could only wrangle me for this intro. But for those who don't know me, which is probably like 80% of the room at least, uh, I play Sersha's love interest in Lady Bird. And this may come as a complete shock in the world of teenage romance, but it doesn't end so well. The first time our characters meet in the script, they shake hands, and our writer-director Greta Gerwig accompanied the action with the following description. There is something instantly sexual between them. Lady Bird has never felt this thing before. She gets all R&B songs ever written in one moment. <laughs> and now I, I struggle with this description mightily because our relationship in real life could not be playing out more differently. <laughs> Sersha kindly walked over to me on one of my first days and she said, you know, I think some of the cast and crew are gonna get drinks after work. Do you wanna come? 
I replied that, you know, I was only 20 years old and thus could not legally consume alcohol. She said, what about a fake ID? I never said that. I never said that. And so I said to that, you know, I said, ah, what's the rush, right? And she replied incredulously, what's the rush? And then she walked away. And I thought to myself, ah, I want you to think I'm cool. <laughs> And Sersha, listen, I wanted you to think I was cool because you are so fucking cool. And that, and that goes beyond the, one, uh, the, um, the, two, the, um, the three Oscar nominations you have now under your belt at 23. It goes beyond the fact that almost every critic has praised your sense of rhythm and the honesty in your performance about the confusion of our teenage years. But what I think what makes Saoirse so true to real life on screen is that she just, she makes it look so natural and so effortless. Effortless, effortlessly, effortless. <laughs> didn't fact check that one. Um, we did an interview together recently and the journalist said to Saoirse that her eyes express so much and he asked her how does she do it? And I don't think there's really an answer. Naturalism is difficult, counterintuitive to the performative instinct, but the pointed naturalism you're able to achieve in this performance, the strong direction you take in each scene, even when Lady Bird is truly clueless, is beyond me. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to get to act with you. So to my coworker, to my friend, Lady Bird, to someone I can say is hella tight. Sir <laughs> 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 so I present to you this Santa Barbara Award. I'm just going to take them with me. Timmy is my prize. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you so much to everyone for coming out. Um, I'll keep this short and sweet because you've been listening to me go on for the last hour and a half. But um, to, to Timmy, um, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of the work that you've done in our film and in Call Me By Your Name and everything that you're going to do. He's brilliant and he's got a good head screwed on his shoulders and I'm very, very proud to know him, so thank you for this. Um, thank you to Anne and, and to Roger and Santa Barbara, all of Santa Barbara, for, for having me back again for the third time. It means so much and I, and I love coming here and it just, there's such a great sense of community here and everything that's gone on here recently, it's a real testament to the, to the people and the, the heart and the spirit of this community that you've all pulled together in the way you have. So, um, you know, thank you for, for just being a wonderful group of people. Um, and that's all I have to say. I'm very, very lucky to get to do what I do. We all are. Um, I truly love it still, you know, 15 years later. And um, getting to look back at some of that work was very special for me. So thank you for sharing tonight with me. Um, it means an awful lot. Take a look at the past Spirit Award winners for Best Supporting Male and you will see an incredible list of featuring some of the greatest actors of all time. By any standard, these are the kind of actors who don't just offer brilliant support, but whose performances provide the foundation for films that we will be talking about for years to come. Here are this year's nominees for Best Supporting Male. Army Hammer, call me by your name. I like the way you say things. I don't know why you're always putting yourself down, though. So you won't, I guess? Call me by your name, and I'll call you by mine. Namdi Asamwa, 
Crown Heights. I have a friend who's in jail for a murder he didn't commit. We can't get no justice for him. Everything we do comes up short. And he's got no fight left in him. Benny Safdie, good time. What are you talking hey, hey, about? Hey. The truck, the, the pan, and the chicken. But wait. he wrote me, he has all my stuff. This is my work. This is my stuff. Sam Rockwell, three billboards outside Ebbing, Missouri. And about time you got home to your mama, Dixon? No, any time I go home to my mama, mama, I told her I was going to be out. Barry Keegan, the killing of a sacred deer. Bob will die, Kim will die, your wife will die. One, paralysis of the limbs. Two, refusal of food to the point of starvation. Three, bleeding from the eyes. Four, death. One, two, three, four. Don't worry, you won't get sick. You just got to stay calm, that's all. All right. And the Spirit Award for Best Supporting Male goes to... Sam Rockwell. Sam Rockwell was nominated for Best Supporting Male in 2013 for the film Seven Psychopaths, which was also written and directed by Martin McDonald. This is his first Spirit Award win. Floor, floor is slippery. Hey, thank you. Thanks to my uh, big love and respect to my fellow nominees. These are really exciting, fantastic actors. Uh, film Independent, thank you. And, and thank you to the entire independent film community. You're my people. You're my family. I've been in like 932 independent films. Hello, everybody. So, uh, Bill Murray won this award 15 years ago. And uh, he said this about acting. He said, I don't believe that you can give the same performance every take, because if you don't do what is happening at that moment, then it's not real, and then you're holding something back. Here are five leading men who all lived in the moment, who kept things very real, and who held absolutely nothing back. These are this year's nominees for Best Male Lead. Timothy Chalamet. Call me by your name. Television, he was very intelligent, but uh -huh. he was more than intelligent. He was good. I think he was better than me. Uh, I think he was better than me. Harris Dickinson, Beach Rats. What's he like? Older. <laughs> Why? Then they don't know anyone I know. Daniel Kaluuya, Get Out. What do you say, dude? He didn't call anyone. No. Why not? <laughs> I don't know. I just thought that if I did, it'd make it real. James Franco, the disaster artist. I am hero, and you all are villain. Yeah, y'all laugh. Ha ha ha. You know what? That would villain do. Okay. Robert Pattinson, good time. How much money can you get for this right now, tonight? I want to move it right now. Now I'm the one who found it, not you. You wouldn't have found anything without me. You were handcuffed to a bed in a hospital. And the Spirit Award for the Best Male Lead goes to... Timothy Chalamet! This is Timothy Chalamet's first ever Spirit Award nomination. For his role in Call Me By Your Name, Timothy learned not only how to speak Italian, but also how to play piano and guitar. In high school, Timothy channeled his musical talent into a rap persona called Lil Timmy Tim. Oh, man. All right. These are always pretty awkward. Okay. Gasoline, or petrol, is a transparent petroleum-derived liquid that is used primarily as a fuel, and I'm just, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. It's, uh, <laughs> no, seriously, it's because they, they were making fun of me earlier, so anyway. But um, look, uh, you know, <laughs> so 
I don't know. I, I'm trying to really savor this moment. I don't know if, you know, this kind of thing is ever going to happen again. So um, I hope it doesn't sound cheesy when I say it, but like, you know, I, I just, I have a lot of faith. I have a lot of faith in this industry. I have a lot of faith for our country. I have faith because of Greta Gerwig and Luca Guadagnino and Josh Safdie and Jordan Peele and Daniel Kaluuya and filmmakers that aren't here, Josh Mond and, and Xavier Dolan. We got, we got a whole new wave. We're going to be good. We're going to be fine. We're going to be good. And, um, and what's really cool is like, this is an independent, this is a ceremony honoring independent film, independent oriented media. And I, again, I have faith, like the people that are being given the keys, I've gotten to know a lot of you now, and we're gonna do it, man. We're, we're gonna make this change, and, um, and it's a day to time, but like, thank God we have the D Reese's and everybody, you know, like, we, we um, anyway, so, uh, Thank you, Sony Picture Classics, Michael Barker. Thank you for the career. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I'm serious. This is crazy. You know, two years ago, I could do a movie like not worrying about whether I was going to have sex with a peach or not because nobody knew who I was. So uh, and uh, now I got to worry a little bit more. And, and, and I like that Andy Samberg song, too, you know, like um, um, that was funny. Uh, Sersha. <laughs> Sersha, we got to be we got to be faithful. We'll, we'll be good. We're going to keep making independent movies. Everybody in here will. This is an amazing thing. Look at where we are. We're in Santa Monica at an airplane hangar. This is amazing. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Please join me in welcoming the Academy Award nominated actor you know from this year's Call Me By Your Name and Lady Bird, Timothy Chalamet. Yeah, hello. Um, I wrote something out, but it's feeling awfully formal now. That was a really surreal experience to see that red bar just slowly climb up. And I'm staring at Paul Thomas Anderson, who's one of my idols, and he's watching this red bar slowly climb. And I felt like I was in the Twilight Zone or something. I got this teleprompter. That's going to be useless, though. So maybe take that away. Um, you know, uh, this is the uh, Texas Film Awards. So I know you guys are looking at Timothée Chalamet, and you're thinking, what the hell is this guy doing here? But I got family in Texas, so I'm not as, uh, yeah, 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 I swear to God, in Dallas. Um, so, uh, and, and our, 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 oh, yeah, whoops, <laughs> sorry. <Yeah. laughs> I'm, I'm a little ignorant to that, you know, uh, okay. And, um, and Army made me promise that I would keep it short and sweet, but, uh, but another, you know, filmmaker that I'm here that I'm really honored to be in front of is uh, Richard Linklater, and I got to do a, a movie with another Texas legend a couple years ago, Matthew McConaughey, and I went home while we were shooting the movie, and I went on Netflix because I wanted to, it was like in the middle of the reconnaissance, so he was like, it was like a lot of, a lot of like excellent movies, and I went home because I was doing a movie with him, and I really wanted to see something that was great, and I threw on Bernie, and I don't know if anybody's seen this in here, but that is... It means nothing, you know, coming from a New Yorker like me, but from, you know, that's like a Texas classic. And there's a bit in there that outlines the different parts of the state, and that's like a real education to a naive person like me. Um, and, um, and lastly, you know, Army and I got the opportunity to be at the Oscars a couple of days ago, which was really one of the most surreal and awesome experiences. And, uh, and it's funny because that was very much supposed to be like the end of the ride. And then he gave me a call and he said, you know, uh, uh, I, I'm getting this award in Austin. Would you come down and do it and, and present it to me? And uh, the truth is they asked Stanley Tucci to do it first, and he couldn't come, which is why you're getting me. But, uh, <laughs> but listen, and then I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. But uh, this, is, uh, <laughs> this is really easy for me to do because um, I'm, I'm young. Obviously, my career has been very short, but, but I, I, and yet I've been you know, fortunate to work with a lot of really great actors, a lot of great human beings, but they all, you know, like the relationship I have with Army is really unlike any, <laughs> oh God, I gotta watch out. <laughs> no, but, uh, no, but seriously, it's really, um, it's unlike the relationship I've had with a lot of, a lot of actors, a lot of people I've worked with, and, um, and, I, you know, I can go on about the acting itself. I think it really speaks for itself. I'm sure a lot of people in here have seen Social Network and uh, Man From U.N.C.L.E. Hopefully Call Me By Your Name. And, uh, and I, you know, they, 
the, the, the teleprompter has an anecdote, so I'll just say a different one instead. But, um, <laughs> you know, there was a moment on call, in Calling By Name, for those that have seen the film, and it's towards the end of the movie, towards the end of the relationship. It seems like this uh, summer romance is going to come to an end. And uh, my character, Elio, is uh, sleeping in bed, and it's the night before there's going to be a train station departure. And we did one take of the scene, and the scene was easy for me. The requisite was just to be sleeping in bed. But for Army, you know, he started at the window, and they needed to come around and sit on the bed. And we did one take, and then our director, Luca Guadagnino, he came over, and he said to Army, you know, do it again, and encompass it's something along these lines. He said, encompass, encompass the whole relationship, the whole summer that's just passed. And we're going to cut to this, this goodbye sequence right after it. And we literally did just one more take after that. I didn't see what he did, because I was sleeping, or pretending to. And, um, and then I got, you know, when I got to the chance to see the movie for the first time at Sundance, you know, I would implore anybody to go back and watch the scene, because you hear it often, but that's like master class acting. And it really is. It's encompassing like 7,000 emotions in one moment. And if I had to point to the acting moment when I watched the movie that always blows my, you know, or takes me away, that, that's really it. And just the working experience with Army, again, like this, I, um, I'm not insecure about how I deliver this because it's really from the heart. And I don't, like, um, I got so lucky with this film of Calling By Our Name, now we're kind of on the other side of it, but this is insane to be speaking in front of, um, Mike Judge, all the, you know, like legends at a young age, it's really, for me, thanks to this film and thanks to the opportunity of working with someone that was totally open to the experience, to the relationship, to the story, and, um, and who was really like team captain um, for our cast, and because he was the one with the experience and knew how to guide the ship, knew how to make something of the caliber of social network. Um, but beyond that, and I always say this, the man that this man is, in an, in an industry that, for like young male actors, there aren't a ton of roadmaps that you like point at and you go, that's, that's somebody I want to become. And I felt this way when I met him. I felt this way a month and a half working with him. And now we've been promoting this movie for nine years, no, for two years. <laughs> like, like um, I, I, I'm just, I'm all the better for it. It's, um, it's humanity. It's loving fatherhood. It's, it's, a, it's being a loving husband. It's bringing humor to work. It's bringing hard work. It's being egoless. Um, and I feel like I, I would be remiss not to shout out Army's wife, who's sitting right next to him, too, Elizabeth Chambers, because, like, like um, in many ways, even, for, even during the production of Calling By Your Name, like, you're really the, the part of the experience and part of the package. Like, Elizabeth and I would joke that, like, I would come over to Army's apartment sometimes, and Chris is going on way longer. I'm sorry, man. I gotta, I gotta wrap this up. But, um, but like, I'll skip that. Elizabeth, I, I love you, man. But, uh, but, uh, but um, and uh, I was gonna say maybe one more thing. And, um, but, I don't know, simply, oh yeah, I gotta introduce this uh, highlight reel. Oh, 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 before that, before that, before that. A big shout out to South by Southwest, because that's awesome, and this film festival is so cool. And uh, it really is. And, and uh, that's awesome. And, um, and, uh, and then a big shout out to this um, organization and getting to hear it all right now as well. There's nothing for a young artist like a marker of encouragement, even if that comes in the form of some financially beneficial package. But seriously, like I did a program called Young Arts in Miami, National Endowment of the Arts. And you know, if some people had their way, all public funding would be cut, you know? And I'm a product of public arts funding. And, um, and um, <laughs> seriously. And, um, and I guess I'm, uh, I guess, uh, I'm going to be introducing a clip reel here, and then I will be joined in the awards presentation by Stephen Gatos, and we'll call Army on stage. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, in a few minutes, I'm going to be joined by Variety, oh, just, uh, and we'll invite Army up here to accept his award. But first, let's take a look back at Army's wonderful work. Let's roll the clips. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Stephen and Variety, for the honor. Uh, I know this probably has to be very surreal for uh, Timmy, having now won about 45 of these over the last season. So if it makes you any comfortable, you can hold this while I'm up here. You're probably much more used to that on stage. Uh, 
thank you, thank you, Timmy, for coming and presenting me with this thing. Uh, it's it's amazing. It's been an incredible ride. Timothy's portrait as Nick Chef in, is an intense and disarming depiction of the hopelessness, despair, and collateral damage of methamphetamine addiction. And as Nick's experimentation with drugs leads to an uncontrollable dependence, his devastated father tries to cope with what has happened and what is happening to his son. It's my pleasure to present the award for Hollywood Supporting Actor to Timothy Chalamet. Uh, thank you so much to the HFA for honoring our film tonight, my director, Felix Van Groenigen, as well. Thank you, Felix, for nurturing me through this audition process of the movie and allowing me to be a part of this urgent story you had already spent years working on. And he didn't get to come today because he's in Florida on a regional tour for the movie right now. But um, I think I have to thank Nick Chef in particular for being so available with his story, for letting me take on the role. Um, this is a, a problem that affects many, many people in the United States right now, a lot of people my age. And uh, working on this film certainly opened my eyes to the reality that addiction affects everyone, the loved ones of the addicted included. This disease does not discriminate. It has no face. So thank you to the HFA for spotlighting this film and giving it a voice. And I'll say lastly, if you haven't yet, go vote. All right, thank you. Cool. Something changed, and I felt myself falling in love for the first time in my life. I was getting inspired in a way 
way I had when I wanted to become an athlete. But this time, the inspiration wasn't to be superhuman, but very human indeed. The invincible Messi's and LeBron's weren't as interesting to me as the artists who were vulnerable for a living. The Heath Ledger's, the Joaquin Phoenix's. The more I saw people in my great act and bear themselves, the more I was inspired, the more I turned to the world of film to watch anything I could get my hands on with young people performing, which is why I'm so damn honored that Laura Dern is presenting to me, because I remember watching Blue Velvet, which you shot when you were 17 years old. I mean, it's such a good move by saying you're watching Wildlife Park, which will be a couple years later. It's why I'm honored to speak in front of Regina King, an actor's actress who buried herself in John Singleton's Boys in the Hood and Poetic Justice when she was only 20 years old. It's the inspiration I felt when I watched Barry Oldman light up the screen as Sid Vicious in his 20s, or as Joe Horton had pricked up her ears a year later. It's a feeling I got was at the Angelica Theater in 2016. I saw the screen credit directed by Barry Jenkins after seeing Moonlight, and it took me hours to remove the knot from my throat. And it's the feeling I got when I walked around Spike Lee's production office in New York in 2015, because I went to school with Spike's daughter, and I was helping her return some film equipment for a music video shoot. And when I got a second one of those hallways, I took pictures of literally everything on the wall because the cinematic history is so damn inspiring. And I still have those pictures are on my iCloud. So, um, <laughs> you know, I'm just going to be somewhere. If you want me to leave them all, I'll leave them. But, um, <laughs> and lastly, it's my grateful to the new chef who let me take on his journey, his lifetime with this role, the loving and caring family member he is, but also the very real and messy human who fell and relapsed 13 times over seven years before finally being sober now for eight years. If you hadn't seen our film, Memoir, and I implore you to because it's a reminder of how messy we can be as people and how from that adversity we can triumph, we can be better from it. Real humans, real stories, a dedicated focus on bringing light to humanity authentically is fucking inspiring. And I look forward to a night acknowledging not our invincibility but rather the art and our flaws. Thank you for this honor. In 2017, NBR recognized Timothy Chalamet with the award for Breakthrough Performance in Call Me By My Name. Tonight, he's here to present this year's award for Best Original Screenplay to Josh Safdie, Benny Safdie, and Ronald Bronstein. <laughs> original screenplay for the Sassy Brothers and Ronnie Bronson. It was challenging for me to write these remarks, not only because of the incredible and intimidating talent in this room tonight, but because what the Sassies do for me as filmmakers is so revolutionary, and it's hard to limit the remarks to simply the screenplay. Also, because I'm a dumb 24-year-old actor, I've never written anything, I stand on a mark, and I say what people tell me to say, so I don't know. But I don't know what insight I have about screenwriting, but here's my go. If I were to try to describe their approach to writing, it is to know exactly what they want in the pre-production process going into filming, and then on the day, finding those tools and gems in a rough collaboration in the day-to-day -day adrenaline of filmmaking. A frenetic style and approach to writing and filmmaking can be interpreted as improvisational and unplanned. But make no mistake, with the Safdies and Ronnie, it is not. This task is made easier when the actors you're working with are of the caliber of Adam Sandler, Keith Stanfield, and Keith Richard Williams. That's not Keith Richards, that's Keith Richard Williams. And if you haven't heard of him, that's because the Safdies literally found them on the street in New York and cast them. Like half the characters in their movies, which sucks for actors like myself and resumes. <laughs> Their 2017 film Good Time was a straight shot about a bank robbery gone wrong and a deranged young man's relentless and untiring attempt to free his brother from custody. The movie follows Robert Pattinson's incredible descent into moralist madness. If Good Time was a shot of tequila, then uncut gems plays like cocaine and mushrooms and a little sprinkled of alpha seltzer on top. Adam Sandler gives a truly awe-inspiring performance. It's like Adam Sandler 
It's like he walks punch through a club and was like, I'm gonna do exactly that again, except the exact opposite. And Josh and Benny and Ronnie created a tornado of stress, swag, fucked up intrigue, and unapologetic, raw, truthful filmmaking. These are pe these are movies people my age can actually not get bored as fuck watching. Let me end on this anecdote. Let me end on this anecdote, and I apologize for personalizing it. About a month ago, I texted a guy who looked up to the most in this business. I invited him to premiere. He said he couldn't come, but he invited me to dinner with Martin Scorsese that'd be happening 30 minutes later that night. I was literally on the toilet when I got that text. So, I did a quick Google Maps check. I was up town within 30 minutes. I hope not to embarrass you for here tonight, but at the dinner I was shocked by Mr. Scorsese's self-deprecation, his razor-sharp wit, and his good humor. I was the young guy at the table, but I was having trouble keeping up with the pace of conversation and sophistication in movies being referenced. I made a joke about how if the Irishman was successful, I'd never work again, because from now on I'd be auditioning against James Dean, Marlon Brando, and Charlie Chaplin. He very calmly and humbly said it was now time for a new generation of filmmakers to take over. And he pointed out, for example, the Safdie brothers, who I didn't know in that moment, and it's unsurprising, he actually executive produced some kind of gems. The comparisons are obvious. They're both truly New York filmmakers in their blood. They both explore the psyche of devilish and morally ambiguous. They both explore the psyche of devilish and morally ambiguous protagonists. In many ways, Adam Sandler's Howard Ratner parallels Ray Liotta's strung out Henry Hill in Goodfellas. This is high praise. I know it. Who am I to dole it out? And yet, this is no longer the golden age of cinema. It's no one's fault, except maybe Ronald Reagan. No, just kidding. Okay. It seems every expression of art has its great moment in time. And yet, this is why we need the Zafty Brothers right now. This is why we need Barry Jenkins and Greta Gerwig and Manny Dio and Ari Aster and Lulu Wang not to reignite the Golden Age party that is definitively over. The world is on fire as we speak, but to make the art that is truthful to the times and true mirror of our times, and in the Safdie's case, really unapologetic too. And maybe it won't be as big a party, but it'll be unique as fuck. So here are Josh and Benny and Ronnie to accept the award for Best Original Screenplay. times I've gotten phone calls after the two of them were writing in their projection booth for hours and, I, and each one of them trying to vie for their own pos positions. It was, it's, I don't know, it's insane. Uh, yeah, I would, I would uh, try to uh, use Benny to try to fight this man right here. Uh, we wrote a lot of the film in a projection booth in New York and uh, often we would, Ronnie and I would be so at odds that we would, I would just sit outside the booth and felt and the people who worked in the theater felt that it was like me being punished in the principal's office for some reason. <laughs> uh, but I, uh, yeah, I, wanna, I would definitely want to thank the National Board of Review. Thank you very much for this. Uh, thank Marty and Emma for reading uh, maybe draft number 50-something. Uh, and then later, A24, about five years ago, reading draft number 70. Uh, and then Scott Rudin and Eli Bush getting involved and in helping contribute to another 70 drafts, probably. Uh, we, it's, it's ironic that you want to point out all the hard work that we put into the writing, because ultimately these guys get on set, and their whole MO is to make it seem like the movie just puked itself out. It was written while I was spooled in the camera. I mean, I, I, for that reason, I want to thank, again, the, the National Board of Review for what will most likely be the only honor that this screenplay will get, because we, we spent, again, I'm likely over 160 drafts, there's probably more, because I lost the computer in the interim. Uh, and uh, the story, it's a long story, I lent it to someone who was making a movie about these homeless romantic drug addicts. And, uh, I got a text someone saying, if you want your computer, it's, it's, a, it's a long story. <laughs> but but uh, uh, I lost a bunch of drafts in that process. But we did spend uh, 
over 160 drafts, you know, changing it for each casting decision, uh, and, and and a lot of people would ask us, you know, some someone came up to me and said, did you even, there was a script for that movie? Uh, and uh, yeah, we, believe it or not, there was. And, and uh, this guy right here next to me, we, we probably, we probably argued more than anything. Some someone came up to me and said, "Did you even?" There was a script for that movie, uh, and uh, yeah, we, believe it or not, there was. And, and uh, this guy right here next to me, we, we probably we probably argued more than anything about what what did Howard's father say to him when he was ten years old, and then not talk to each other for weeks if he would remember that or not. Uh, so, so thank you everybody for that, and and, and uh, to be here in a room with with great writers yesterday. Uh, Mr. Tarantino met, met, talked about spending. Uh, Brad Pitt talked about Tarantino spending hours and hours and days writing about his characters. And uh, to me, the, the sad part about this film is that I will no longer have Howard uh, to filter my life through. So I'll miss you, Howard, and I love you, Sam. Uh, you know, Timmy said he used the term unapologetic, which seems to show up a lot, I guess, in the context of this movie and the, the last two that we've made. But I guess this is a. I'll take this as an opportunity. To, I'll take this as an opportunity to uh, apologize to the to the script itself, the long-suffering script. Um, you know, we're very anxious people by nature. You know, the, the, we're anxious about the process of screenwriting. You know, it's. Um, I'm anxious. You know, uh, no idea is so good that it doesn't putrefy. And you know, sour like old milk the second I, I, we put it down on the page, you know? So what happens is we do all of this work to sort of um, delineate the ideas in the screenplay format as sensitively as we possibly can. And then we get so petrified seeing them sitting there static, you know, that we, we feel compelled to, to just heap all of this extraneous character detail on top of it and so we can't even recognize the sort of base foundational ideas. And that sort of abuse to feel like it's written while it runs through the camera. And then we get into post-production. And, you know, Benny and I as editors, it's almost like we're, we're new writers that have been hired onto the team. And we're looking to, you know, get a leg up by selling the original writers, you know, down, down the river. And by the time we get into sound design, so much cacophony, there's just so much been layered on top of that original writing that um, that it's a miracle that the that the screenplay doesn't just nebulize, you know, it doesn't just like turn to vapor under all that weight. So, you know, I guess it's a testament to the to the written word that I guess, you know, that it survived. And uh, and uh, I appreciate it and we apologize to all the abuse and the indignity that we heaped on it. So thanks. Thank you everybody. Academy Award winning actress Natalie Portman. Everybody comes to Rick's. Shoeless Joe. QA. Diversion. But you may know them better as the films they became Casablanca, Field of Dreams, Slumdog Millionaire, and Fatal Attraction. Like the writers of those classic films, this year's nominated writers have managed to capture the essence of their source material in a way that is entirely unique and original. Here are this year's nominees for Best Adapted Screenplay. The Irishman, screenplay by Stephen Zalian. Based on the book, I Heard You Paint Houses by Charles Brandt. You know who owns the Cadillac Linden Service? Some Jews in the laundry business, that's what they told me. They own a part of it. Somebody else got an interest in that. You know who? No. I do. Who? Oh. No, I do. I own the other part. Not I know somebody who owns the other part. Little Women, written for the screen by Greta Gerwig, based on the novel by Louisa May Alcott. Who will be interested in a story of domestic struggles and joys? It doesn't have any real importance, does it? Maybe it doesn't seem important because people don't write about them. Writing doesn't confer importance, it reflects it. I don't think so. Writing them will make them more important. Joker, 
Written by Todd Phillips and Scott Silver. Based on characters created by Bob Kane, Bill Finger, and Jerry Robinson. As the door closes on his new face, Arthur, now Joker, dancing his way down the long staircase, doing his own Bill Bojangles Robinson stair dance, skipping and twirling down steps, dancing and singing along to the music in his head. Jojo Rabbit, screenplay by Taika Waititi, based on the book Caging Skies by Christine Lemons. Excuse me. Little girl. Um, do you girl on the wall? You, you. Adolf encourages Jojo to continue. The Two Popes, written by Anthony McCartan, based on his play, The Pope. I cannot feel the presence of God. I do not hear his voice. Do you understand me? No, no you're mistaken. You are a mistake. I believe in God. I pray to God. Silence! And the Oscar goes to Taika Waititi. This is the first Oscar and third nomination for Taika Waititi. Welcome, Shia LaBeouf and Zach Gutsakin. Hello to the class of 2020. I'm happy to get a chance to be here and to celebrate with all of you tonight. I can't imagine what the last couple of months has been like for students, let alone for high school seniors, not being able to attend your graduation ceremonies. I'm joined by this year's 2020 graduates from LaGuardia High School who are behind me in thanking those teachers who inspire us. I want to shout out three of my own, Mr. Lobenhofer, Ms. Faison, and Ms. Lawton. Thank you for your valiant efforts to teach me the art of statistics. Thank you for everything. Congratulations to the class of 2020. Be well, be safe, peace and love. Hey, last one, last one, last one. Okay, and then I'll be done. I swear to God, this is the part of the footage that leaks on YouTube like three years ago. I'm 46 months out of school. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to graduate. I'm going to graduate. There are a lot of us who are caught up in this hell we all live in, content with being blinded by rules and judgment. We live in a world where it's more okay to follow than to lead. In this world, being a leader is trouble for the system we're all accustomed to. Being a leader in this day and age is being a threat. Not many people stood up against the system we all call life. But towards the end of our first 10 years into the millennium, we heard a voice, a voice who spoke to us from the underground, a voice who spoke of vulnerabilities and other human emotions never before heard so vividly and honest. This is the story of a man who believed not just in himself, but in his dreams too. This is the story of the man on the moon.